The Camino de Santiago, also known as the Way of St. James, is a network of ancient pilgrimage routes that lead to Santiago de Compostela in northwestern Spain. I walked the Camino Frances, the French route. It begins in the town of St. Jean, Pier de Port, France, about four miles from the border of Spain, and stretches almost 500 miles across northern Spain to Santiago de Compostela. I walked it in 31 days with one day of rest along the way. The Camino has been a pilgrimage route for more than a thousand years, and there is evidence that there was a route in pre-Christian times. According to Christianity, one of the original apostles, Santiago, also known as St. James, walked the route while spreading religion throughout the Iberian Peninsula of Spain. The Camino grew in popularity in the Middle Ages, with more than 250,000 pilgrims traveling along the Camino each year. Due to the Black Death, Protestation Reformation, and political unrest in the 16th century, only a few hundred pilgrims walk the Camino. Today, it attracts pilgrims from all over the world. In 2023, over 445,000 pilgrims, or peregrinos as they are known in Spanish, finished the Camino, an all-time high. I was one of them. You may be aware that when Catholics go to confession, they atone for their sins through some form of penance, usually prayers. In medieval times, the Camino pilgrimage was deemed to be a suitable penance for sins. In addition, pilgrimages were imposed as judicial punishment for a crime. A prisoner was given the choice, prison time or, accompanied by a guard, walk the Camino wearing a heavy backpack. Most pilgrims walk for religious or spiritual reasons or as a personal challenge. I did it as a personal challenge although some days for me, it became emotional. The document that certifies your journey is called a Compostela. To earn a Compostela, you must complete at least 100 kilometers by foot or horseback, or 200 kilometers by bicycle on any of the routes that make up the Camino, and you must be able to prove that distance covered. The credential used to document your walk is referred to as a pilgrim's passport. It must be stamped twice a day for the final 100 kilometers if walking or on horseback or 200 kilometers if by bicycle. The shell you see is a symbol of the Camino. Over the centuries, it has taken on a variety of meanings, metaphorical, practical, and mythical. During medieval times, it was more a proof of completion than a symbol. It is typically attached to your backpack, and it signifies that you are a peregrino or a peregrina. On this trail, you will see this rendition of the shell as a way marker to guide you on the route. This is a map of the French way, or route, as it starts in saint jean pierre de port France. You can see it on the upper right corner, four miles from the border of Spain. While on the Camino, it is common to hear people wish each other a buen camino. It means good way, good journey. It is a wish for a safe, healthy, and enjoyable physical trip, as well as a fruitful spiritual journey. It's heard every day along the Camino. So the first day up the pyramids, I started in the dark. Of course, I couldn't sleep the night before. And it soon got light, and I could see how beautiful the climb was. It was pretty much a paved road. But I was told at the pilgrim's office when I checked in the day before that when I got to the cross, I was supposed to get off the road and go on the dirt path. Well, about two miles up, it got very cloudy and misty and I couldn't see more than 25 feet in front of me. About four miles up, there's an Arbitiga. A lot of the people would go that far and then wait, stay the night, and then go the rest of the way. Not me. This was a 15-mile day. It took me 10 hours to get across. 
So as I climbed the mountain, I saw a arrow pointing to the right on the road with a C. And I thought, there's a cross. I walked off the, the road and I saw the cross. I couldn't see much further than the cross because of the fog. I mean, it was thick. I was walking in soup. I forgot that I was supposed to get off the road. But when I was in the Peregrino's office, they marked the left side of the road where the cross was. This was on the right side, so I thought, this is not the cross. So I went back up, started climbing up on the road. And maybe a quarter mile up, there were three ladies from Texas, one of the daughters and the daughter's boyfriend walking down. And they said, you need to turn around. I said, why? He says, you missed turning off at the cross. We're supposed to get off the trail. Well, one of them had been on the hike before and remembered, but remembered after they had passed it. So we all turned around and went back to the cross and then we could walk a little ways, we could see the trail where it was. Had I not been, had I not run into them, I probably would have climbed to the very top of the Pyrenees. I would have gotten to my destination, but the long way, the long way. And from there on, I would run across them every day. They were on the same path. They were going to Lyon, then they were going home. So they weren't going the whole route. That morning, as we got off the trail, my leg cramped up a little bit. So I stopped, took my pack off, took some electrolytes, stuff, water that I had. And one of them came up, she said, are you okay? Actually, the daughter told her, mom, that man's having problem. So she came back. I said, it's just a cramp, it's going away. She said, I got pills, electrolytes. I said, no, no, thanks. From that time on, they would watch out for me. If I was resting by the road and they passed, they would ask me if I was okay. And we kept passing each other and became as much of a friend as you can be. When I got to Lyon, later, waiting for my daughter, I went out that evening to get something to eat and I ran into the three of them. They were going to take the train to Paris the next day, spend a couple of days in Paris and go home to Texas. And we took a, a nice photo together. Again, I didn't think of getting any contact information, but I'll always remember how they looked out for me and kept asking me, are you okay? Are you fine? And you'll see in the photo of them just how happy they are. And one of them was so inspired that Maritza was going to walk with me. She said, Danny, I'm bringing my son next year to do what you did and have him walk with me. And so I'm sure she will. I'm sure she will. As I left Pamplona, I could see the mountains I was headed for. I knew I was probably going to go to the top of those mountains. There are windmills up there. When I arrived, I came across the Alto de Perdón, the Hill of Forgiveness. These iconic sculptures are dedicated to the pilgrims who walk the Camino. It is named after a 13th century basilica named Nuestra Señora de Perdón, Our Lady of Atonement which was destroyed by Napoleon's troops. The Altar de Perdón was erected in 1996 and is one of the great symbols of the Camino. It's a small history of pilgrims through the various stages of development. Here, pilgrims forgive and ask for forgiveness. 
The metal sculptures represent pilgrims on foot or horseback and reflect the historical and eternal nature of the walk. From there, it was a downhill walk to La Puente, much easier than climbing up to the top of the mountain. I was really looking forward to the walk from Estrella to Los Arcos because I had read about a fountain of wine that flowed 24 hours a day. And it was not long before I came upon the Achichu Vineyards and the fountain of wine. It's true, there is a fountain of wine. I was able to taste the wine, red wine. They had both red and white wine. My cup was at the bottom of my pack and I didn't want to dig out for it so I used my shell as a cup to drink the wine and I wondered if the locals would ever come at night and take some wine home but it is there it is for real the fountain of wine flows red and white wine So this morning I started very early, in the dark. I had a headlamp. I wasn't the first one out, there were other, I could see light in front of me. And as I walked, I could see what I learned to be the August moon. The August moon was setting in front of me at the same time the sun was coming up behind me. I have never experienced that. And I thought as that moon was setting, whether my wife could see it rising at home as I was seeing it settle. And as a matter of fact, she did see it, but I'm not sure if it was at the same time. But it was a very profound and emotional mo moment for me, thinking about my family back home while I was here walking. Later in that same day, it became very emotional for me. I was by myself, my thoughts to myself, very few people around me. My daughter Marisa wouldn't get to join me until I got to Lyon, and my mind wandered in many different directions. It was during this part of the walk I experienced a very emotional moment that brought tears to my eyes. I thought of people who were in my life and who had passed away, no longer with me. My parents. My sister Martha, who passed five weeks after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I thought about my friends, my compadre Ronnie. We had been friends since three years old, friends for 70 years, and the Lord took him on August 23rd of 2020, three years from the day I started off in France. He would tell me I would be crazy for walking, but he would support me every step of the way. I thought about my compadre Jim, who died in his sleep, who would walk the Grand Canyon many times. I know he would join me on this walk if he'd still be alive. I thought about my friend Sam, who we lost to a battle with cancer. My friend Raul, who I hired at the health department when he retired from the health department in El Paso. He struggled with diabetes since age seven. I got a call from his wife one day that she was putting him in hospice and I left Green Valley as soon as I heard to drive to El Paso to say bye to him. Somewhere in Deming, as I crossed Deming, he passed. I never made it to say goodbye to my friend. Thought about my brother-in-law, David, my sister's husband, who also passed from pancreatic cancer. As I thought about all of these people, I wondered, why me? Why do I get to be so lucky to do this walk? What have I done to deserve it or what? What is it that people go before you and you're still here? I thought about my great school friend, Bobby, 
who I lost track of for 50 years. And when we finally reconnected, I was sad to hear he's having his own major medical problems. It seems so unfair, yet here I am, a healthy 76-year-old doing this walk. Why was I given this opportunity? It was one of the most emotional days. It was the most emotional day of my Camino. So I left Nahira again in the dark. I try to start early so I can get where I'm going early and of course secure the bed for the night. But as I left Nahira, I could see it was dark and I could see lightning and hear the thunder. And I didn't want to get caught by surprise so I put my rain gear on, my rain pants, my rain jacket. I put my rain cover on my backpack. And in no time, it was pouring rain pouring rain, me with my headlamp. I could see when the lightning would hit, I could see walkers in front of me. And what scared me was the lightning. I mean, I was holding a walking stick, which is like a lightning rod. And so, you know, I kept thinking, why well, lightning, stay away from me. And I, I walked in the dark, and then I saw a few other peregrinos standing against the wall at a farmhouse, kind of shielded from the rain. And so we waited. And when the rain started to die down, they started walking a little bit right and then made a, hit a curve on the road. I would have kept walking straight. I would have gone the wrong way. I just thought they, they seemed to know where they're going. It was dark. And so I followed them and it turned out to be the right move. The biggest challenge that day was the mud. That happened to be the muddiest day of my whole Camino. And as you can see, the downhill slope, the mud tracks as a car had gone by earlier. And I just kept thinking, man, I hope I don't slip and fall because it would be a muddy walk the rest of the day. And that was a rain off and on all day long. As I walked through a very small hamlet, I ran across a gentleman roasting what I thought were green chilies in a barrel. Very proud with an apron on, and I thought at first it was green chili. So I stopped and talked to him, and he would demonstrate, show them to me, and told me they were pimentos. He was roasting pimentos, and that he was doing that alongside the path, and peregrinos were stopping and watching him and talking to him. And he just seemed so proud of what he was doing, and so glad to demonstrate, you know, roasting those pimentos. Later on, I got to Beldoro. I found my albirga. That was a wash day, so I washed and uh, then went out looking for a place to eat dinner. And along the town, through the route, I would see bronze plaques on the cement that had names of people I didn't recognize. And it, it would say artist or poet, poet or whatever their occupation was. And it had their handprint and their footprint and the date they were there. The town had put up a plaque calling these the Path of Encouragement to honor the peregrinos that had walked there for their visit, for the way they impact the Camino and how they impact on that town. So there were several of these on their sidewalk. And then I ran across one I recognized. There on the ground was a bronze pack with Martin Sheen's name, honoring him for his movie, The Way. Had his handprint and his footprint. And it was just amazing how the town knew how the Camino affected them as a community, and they honored them. 
That evening, I ran into a mariachi band with ballet folklorico dancers. They were celebrating the patron saint, I think, of the town, the church. The next morning, I left very, very early, and as I walked through the same place I had run into the mariachi, there were still people celebrating, young kids mostly. And so I stopped because there was no one else around and asked him, is this the Camino? There were three of them. One told me, no, it's that way, pointed in a direction. Another one told me, no, it's that way, pointing in another direction. So I knew they were playing games with me. And then one stepped up and said, no, don't pay attention to them. You're going the right way. And so I did. I, I went that way and eventually saw other walkers, so I knew I was on the right route. But that was a town that honored the walkers in a very unique way. Ajes was my next destination on this day, and it entailed a long climb up a mountain. There were very dark clouds in front of me. I thought I'd run into rain, but the clouds actually were going in the same direction I was, so I never encountered the rain. But late in that day, I got into Ajes, and to me, it was one of the most beautiful small towns I had ever seen. Very clean very picturesque, flowers everywhere. Every door, every house had bright, beautiful flowers demonstrated. And it had just rained, and so everything just looked crystal clear and clean. And I took some pictures of that, which I've put on my wall at home, because I was so impressed. Most of the towns, well, all of the towns I, I crossed were very, very clean. People took a lot of pride in keeping it clean for the peregrinos and showing pride, pride in their community, just like Ajes was. Day 13 was my longest day walking, my longest mileage day to that point, 19 and a half mile day. After about seven miles, I passed through a town of Torlajos and I had breakfast there. And then as I left the community, walked out, I passed by a small chapel and there were pilgrims walking out. So I decided to go in and see what the little chapel was like. Most chapels, even though they're not used anymore, are open. They have a donation box for you and they use the donations to keep up the church for peregrinos to see. But inside this particular chapel, there was a nun, and she was praying over peregrinos' heads. So I walked up to her, and she asked me if I spoke Spanish. I said, yes. She says, bow your head. So I bowed my head. She put her hand on me, and she said a prayer for me and for my family in Spanish. And then she gave me a small medallion which she put on my neck. She would give that to everybody. And then she gave me a hug. She did that to everybody. I was so impressed and so taken by, by her commitment to be there at that church and do this for the walkers. So of course I put money in the donation box.
So this particular day, I, I was walking to Calzadilla, and I had a choice of two different routes. And the guide that I had that was keeping me on track said, take the northern route. It is the official original route. And so there was nobody around me at this time, and it was just open fields. And so I took the right route, took to the right. Others, I'm sure, went left because for about these four or five miles, I saw no one. I was by myself. It was just empty fields. And I kept wondering, did I miss a turn? Did I do the wrong thing? Should I have gone the other route? Because it was just, it was just a little eerie out there by yourself. At one time, I looked back and I saw a, another hiker way back behind me, far back. And then later on, when I turned to look, there was no one there. So again, I wondered, did that person take a turn I missed? I could do nothing but keep walking. Every once in a while, I would see the yellow arrow saying, this is the Camino. So I felt better, but uncomfortable. And then I finally did reach the albergue where I was going to stay. It was the first albergue that didn't charge, that just asked for a donation. And so it was run by the town. I just kind of averaged the highest I paid and the lowest I paid, and I made my donation. And they don't know what you donate because you put it in a slot, they don't even see it. So you know, it's not like they're keeping an eye on you. So the next day I started, it wasn't in the dark, I started early, and I was walking across agricultural fields, nothing, rainbow, beautiful rainbow, and nobody around me. There must have been somebody in front of me because I heard dogs barking up ahead. So I figured there's a farmhouse or a barn or something there. I kept walking and soon I saw a dog sitting in the middle of the field just barking at me, just barking, a big, large black dog, almost like a Rottweiler, but it wasn't, but it was that large and that menacing, really. And so as I walked near and started walking by him, I saw another dog running towards me. And he didn't stop where the other dog was. He just kept running, got up right behind me and was just growling and barking and barking. To the point that I became very concerned, I even turned around walking backwards to keep an eye on him. And I know I couldn't pick up a rock. I know I couldn't outrun him because with my backpack on. And so all I could do was hope that he wouldn't attack me. I saw no farmhouses, nothing, nothing but fields. And I just figured they were protecting a territory. So eventually he left me alone. Eventually he stopped, kept barking as I walked further away. And then after a while I heard the dogs barking behind me. So I knew there was another walker coming along. Well, later that day, I ran into a French couple, a couple from France who were on the same route. And I asked them, did you encounter the dogs? I said, I saw three of them. He said, three of them? Yeah, we did. There were eight of them when we came across. And he said, there was a lady walking behind us and we were worried about her. She was by herself. That was the only time that I had any trouble with any dogs. I've heard other peregrinos feel uncomfortable at times, but out in the middle of nowhere, just dogs were there protecting their territory. It was probably the scariest day of my life on that walk. So I looked forward to arriving in Lyon because the next day my daughter was going to be getting there to join me for the rest of my walk. And she had originally planned to start in France with me, but there were some challenges for her getting off of work. So she decided to delay it and meet me in Lyon, which would give her about 190 miles of walking. I had been to Lyon before. So when I got there that evening, I found an albergue right near the center of town. There was an old monastery and took my shower, did what I had to do, went out to look for a place to eat. Came back to the albergue to rest for a while. When a nun walks in and to put it mildly, she recruited us to go to the monastery next door and sing songs in the church and say some prayers. So almost everyone that was in the Arbirga at that time was herded over to the little chapel next door. There were other nuns waiting and she gave us a songbook in the language that we spoke. 
There were people from other countries, so she had song books in different languages. And, and so we kind of rehearsed a little bit and then walked into this chapel and she would lead us in, in songs. And it was interesting to hear everybody singing the same song in different languages. So my daughter arrived, she had flown into Madrid and took the, uh, the train to Leon. And she arrived in the afternoon. So she got settled in and I said, we need to go get some patata and beer, which is a tradition. It was called the Calle Humido, which I had been to before, but I remember it being a very large street. And so I looked for it, I couldn't find it. And after a while I learned that I was just staying two blocks away from it. So when Maritza came into town, I said, we need to leave because otherwise we're gonna go get hurt and have to go pray again tonight and we need to go get something to eat. So we went to the Barrio Humido and, and got the traditional beer and potatoes, patatas and beer. It was not as busy as it was when I had been there before. I think because this was during the week and we had been there on a the weekend and it's a lot busier. What I learned in in Spain throughout my walk was uh, the kitchens don't open till seven or eight o'clock at night. So you eat a late dinner or you eat a ham sandwich or something if you want to eat earlier. But Maritza was there to start the walk with me the next day. And that for me was highlight of, of the career and having my daughter join me, having her experience some of the walk. To my surprise, she was up early. I thought I knew she'd be tired and jet lagged and so forth, but she was anxious to get walking, and we left in the dark. It took us about an hour and a half to get out of the suburbs of Lyon, to get out of town actually on a trail. And, and that day's trail was very easy, but not a short day. The next day would be a very long day. And so we walked out of the suburbs into a small town, had breakfast, and encountered some rain that day and got put into the next town we were gonna stay in, a very nice albirga, and that was a day for washing, for me anyway, and had some, a good dinner and stuff. She did very well on the walk. We started walking and it was a, I believe a 20 mile walk, which was a long day for her. Second day, jet lag. We wanted to get to a place where we would take the northern route. We didn't want to walk along close to the highway. We wanted to get out into the country. We learned that the, the turnoff to go north was at a place called Hospital. And when we got to Hospital, there was a turnaround and that is where we should have gone to the right. We didn't see a sign or anything, so we kept going straight along the road. And so after a while we said, you know, this is not right. Let's cut across fields and go meet the trail up there. And so we did. And Maritza's art started hurting her. We, we got off the main route, went looking, couldn't find it, walked a long ways. Finally, as we crossed the road, we ran across what is called the Guarda Civil, the civil police that are there to protect the hikers. And we asked them, we're looking for the trail up here somewhere. We know we're close. And they said, there's no trail up here. They told us, go back to the highway, go back down. So we were disappointed. So we started walking back towards the highway. And a short time later, we ran into another Guardia Civil on a bike. And so we told him, he said, they're wrong. There is a trail up there. And so <laughs> we were so close to the road then that we just kept going and went the route. But Maritza struggled that day with her arch. She was walking very slow and was hurting. We got to Astorga in a downpour and we went looking for a shoe store, a store that sold hiking shoes and but she wanted to eat first. So we went to eat and then by the time we got to the store, it was closed, 10 o'clock. <laughs> and so she says, Dad, I'll stay here tomorrow. I'll go find some shoes. That's probably what the problem is. And I'll catch a bus and I'll meet you at the next destination. My daughter's traveled internationally several times, so she knew how to get along in other countries. She spoke the language very well, so yeah, I was a little worried, but uh, I did leave her the next morning to tend to that foot of hers.
The Cruz de Fierro is, the, the cross of iron is one of the highlights of the Camino. And it was one of the must-get-to destinations for me. The Cruz de Fierro is a cross that is a very high cross that legend has it was put there by St. James. The tradition is you bring a small stone from home is where you really start your journey and place it at the foot of the cross and say a prayer for whoever, whatever you want. I had a stone from my friend Bobby, who was going through some medical challenges, he gave me to place there. And I had a rosary from his wife, he asked me to place there because she was going through some medical challenges as well. And so for me, it was a, a must get to place. And so the next morning at Afonso Bayon, Marisa was not with me because she stayed in Astorga and was going to meet me two days later. And so I got to the cross and I placed my stone. And if, at that point, if I didn't finish the walk, I felt I had accomplished what I had come to do, is at least get to there. I found out later that the location of the cross is the highest elevation climb in the, all of the Camino. I thought the Pyrenees was. Now the Pyrenees is a higher mountain, but the trail didn't go all the way to the top. But this location was the highest elevation by less than 100 feet, I think, of the whole Camino. Very beautiful country. Maritza was not able to walk to La Faba. So when I walked out of uh, the Albirga, I left my daughter behind because she had, in addition to her foot problems, she woke up with a swollen eye and swollen welts on her arm. And after a couple of visits to the doctor and pharmacy, we found out she was allergic to the mosquito saliva. So she was bitten by a mosquito and developed that reaction. So again, I had to leave her. Uh, and she said, Dad, don't worry, I'll be fine. And of course, a dad. So this route, to La Faba was one, again, where you had a direction to go right up the mountains or stay more along the, the road. And I decided I was going to stay along the road because going up through the mountain was a little further, a little more distance. But when I got across the bridge there, I saw the arrow going right and I just went right and I climbed and I climbed. I was above the clouds. I could see the clouds below me in some cases. And so getting down to the road from there, I went through several real beautiful little communities. When I got to La Fava, Maritza was there. The next day we walked together. She was able to walk and we walked through again some very, very beautiful country. She walked up to maybe the last couple of miles and then her foot was better but not wasn't a hundred percent but she saw a cafe bar along the way and she decided to stop there and she says I'll stop here I'm gonna have a snack and then I'll take a cab the rest of the way in and so that day she walked almost the whole route and then took a cab and, and met me at the Albirga just as I got there she got there right after I did so I was glad to see her walking again but still having trouble with her arch on her foot
During the whole time that Maritza was with me, she would say, Dad, I'm going to walk the last day with you. You and I will walk together the last day. So Maritza was determined to walk the last day with me, and we did. We started together in the morning. We knew that the last four or five miles were pavement, and Santiago is a big city. You could see you were in the suburbs a long ways out from the cathedral we were going to. And so that was probably a day where we started out in the country, going through some beautiful fields, and then coming to town, we started running into houses and industry and buildings, and we started seeing people with strollers walking. So we knew that some people would come out a ways and then walk in, that they were not persons who would walk the whole route, but they wanted to experience some of it. I remember Santiago de Compostela, and I told her we're gonna start getting into some very narrow old part of town, and we did. And we walked into the plaza where the cathedral is, and I ran into my friend from Poland. <laughs> so I knew he, he finished the walk, and I just regret I never got a picture of him. He, he took a picture, in his camera, he had Maritza take a picture of us. And I just didn't, for some reason, ask my daughter to take a picture with my camera. So I said goodbye to Poland, and he said goodbye, USA, uh, knowing we'd never see each other again. And so as we walked into the cathedral, I felt a sense of, now what? So I had to walk about a block to the pilgrim's office to turn my credentials in and get my certificate, and I also got my mileage certification. Maritza could not go in with me. Only, only people who were able to get that could go in. You, you just couldn't walk in unless you were, you finished the hike and were getting the certificate. So when I walked out with my certificate, Maritza said, I'm disappointed. I said, why? I said, there should be balloons, there should be fireworks, there should be all this celebration and there's nothing, <laughs> you know? And she was right. It was, it was just, I just did it. I didn't, I didn't know what to feel. I thought maybe there should be more than this, but I did what I set out to do. I saw other hikers walk in, crying their eyes out. So everyone has a different reason for walking, so everyone has a different feeling, I guess, when they finish. Emotional, spiritual. To me, I accomplished the challenge that I faced and, and I thought back of all the days that I, had, that I had walked and was glad after four years of trying, I was able to get out there and do it. My thoughts after finishing the Camino were varied. I was so glad our daughter Maritza was able to join me. Even though she did not begin her walk in France, we had some great moments together and I learned so much about her especially how well she spoke and understood Spanish. I cherish walking the final day to Santiago together. That was special. I was proud that I had walked the full route, carrying my backpack every step of the way. I thought, now what? What's my next challenge? After arriving home, I was a bit disoriented and a bit sad. For a few nights, I would wake up wondering which way is the bathroom, only to realize I was home. In the morning, I would look for clothes to wear, unable to make up my mind what to wear that day. I thought of the three sets of clothes I wore for a month, washing two sets every other day. Mornings on the Camino, I would be out the door in 30 minutes or less. My pack would be ready the night before. I would wash, many times getting dressed in the dark, so as not to wake others. I was so organized when walking the Camino, not so much at home. On the Camino, there was only one task to accomplish each day, one clear goal, to get to the next destination. I walked an average of 16 miles a day, leaving as early as possible to get to my next destination early enough to make sure I secured a bed for the night. At home, I had a bed every night. I find that walking three miles a day at home is not a challenge. On the Camino, I accepted the challenges of each day, the grind during the first week, the discomfort of my right knee, not realizing I was walking on a torn meniscus, 
the challenge of steep terrain, wet or rocky trails, the thunder and lightning while walking in the dark on an early morning start. The dogs challenged me out in the middle of nowhere, not always encountering a place to eat when I was hungry and changes in the weather. As I pass crosses or memorials of peregrinos who died while walking, I hope that fate would not await me. I will always remember the friends I met along the way, wishing I would have taken pictures of all of them, especially my friend from Poland. We stayed in many of the same albergues and ate at many of the same restaurants. We met the final time on my last day in Santiago. He also received his Compostela, and we said goodbye, knowing we would never meet again. I never asked his name. I just called him Poland. He never asked my name. He just called me USA. I will always remember my discussions when meeting peregrinos from different countries and their many different accents. When we passed each other on the trail or when leaving in the morning, we'd always wish each other a buen camino. At home, I mutter under my breath when I see someone ambling too slowly in front of me. On the camino, I would ask if they were okay, did they need help, and I always wish them a buen camino. I wonder if I am able to reboot myself to be the person I was on the camino. Am I now more willing to let random thoughts rattle around my head, more willing to let go of hurts, to hang on to joy? I try to move away from being a person in control, or so I think, to one who is waiting for a surprise. Will it rain? Will it be hot? Will I fall and hurt myself? Who will I meet today? Will I walk further or faster than yesterday? Why can't the many different cultures, beliefs, languages, and people get along at home like we did on the Camino? I sometimes think the best version of all of us was on that trip. I miss the Camino. I hope those around me see a positive change in me. Only time will tell. I hope my wife Becky, our son Miguel, and our daughter Stacy walk that path someday. I know it will expand their hearts as it has mine. They too may find the most patient version, the very best version of themselves, just as I believe I have done. If I have walked all those miles for that, it would be enough. Should you ever get the opportunity to walk the Camino, I wish you a buen Camino.